I'm very pleased to be here this morning um, having the opening presentation at the Circular Economy Conference. I would also like to take the opportunity and thank Sonia Yonashova and the, the whole INSEAN crew basically for organizing or pulling together this amazing event about circular economy. So circular economy has been appearing in the press um, recently very often and one of the main reasons for that is also evidenced within the recent um, OECD reports um, which shows that without um, or in the absence of the new policies, um, the material consumption from now to 2060 is going to double. Um, more than that, um, this material consumption, the increase in material consumption is also going to drive the greenhouse gas emissions increase, which is going to more than double by 2060. And that stands at the contrary to what the IPCC international report is saying that we need, in order to keep the temperature increase to 1.5 Celsius degrees, we need to be um, CO2 um, net zero by 2050. And so I'm here today to talk about the circular economy and how circular economy can help um, to tackle these challenges around material increases on the one hand, but also around um, these environmental ad adverse implications or the externalities. And I'm going to do that by walking you through um, some past trends in material consumption and waste management, and then show you how the future might look like according to the OECD projections. And then we are going to talk about what is circular economy and how circular economy can be operationalized through circular business models and how this is facilitated in turn through the digitalization. And my very last slide is going to be about a project that the OECD is currently kicking off with the Ministry of Environment for um, Circular Economy here in the Czech Republic. So I'll try not to speak too fast, and I'll try not to make it too theoretical. I've prepared loads of examples, but in case I'm not able to cover everything, please do come back with questions and during the panel. We'll be very happy to um, also engage with the other panelists. So to get us started, um, some past trends in the material consumption and the waste management, looking at the... Um, the upstream side, you see that some progress in the coupling of materials has been occurring. But if you look at it, it's actually only the case for the OECD countries. If you look at the right-hand side, you see that the world, the material consumption is actually increasing. And this is obviously because of the increasing or the, the growing economies of, of, well, of the emerging world. Um, even more so, if you look at the hidden flows, these are further altering the picture. So you see that if we take a look at the domestic uh, material consumption, which is the usual um, indicator that we are looking at, we are doing all pretty well. But if you take a look into the total material consumption, which means that um, in, um, encompassing also the production of, of used from the imported materials, this is actually quite doubling, so providing a very ambiguous picture. On the downstream, the decoupling has been well underway, and you will see it by from the decreasing the landfill rates, but also the increasing in the in the in the recycling, which is the green the green one. And in general, if you look at the bar chart, you will see that the municipal waste um, is the the total amount is on decrease. So this was the past. So how might the future look like? According to the OECD product projections. And these are um, recent numbers from our recent report. You will see that, um, that from the 2011 level or from the 2017 level, which is 90 gigatons, um, by 2060, the material consumption is going to double. And this is basically driven by the economic growth, which we are expecting to quadruple till 2060. But it's luckily also being driven down by some of the structural change, which is the servitization of the economy, and the technological change, so introduction of more resource-efficient technologies. So this is one part of the story. Um, when we look at the disaggregated figures, you will see that actually not all the materials are contributing to this growth at, by the same stake. So you'll see that the non-metallic minerals, which are the brown ones, the light brown ones, which are used basically for the construction, are driving this entire trend. And this is followed by the metals. So together metals and non-metallic minerals are going to triple by 2060. So why are we talking about this? Because the whole, excuse me, 
the whole uh, materials management is actually um, contributing to two-thirds of the entire greenhouse gas emissions. So two-thirds of all the CO2 equivalent of greenhouse gas emissions are driven by material extraction, material use, and the waste. And this means that by 80 um, gigatons in 2060, 50 gigatons of CO2 equivalent emissions are going to be associated with the entire material cycle. 12% of these are going to be contributed by seven key metals. And another 12% are going to be contributed by the concrete. So what is the role of the circular economy in all this, you might be asking. Well, let's try first to look at what circular economy actually is. And I can tell you from my experience as a researcher in circular economy for several years, there is nothing like one circular economy definition. There are, however, three accepted definitions or views on circular economy. So the first one is around closing the resource loops. This is basically around increased material recycling and bringing the materials or the waste back as materials. The second one, which is a broader one, is slowing the resource loops and has to do a lot around the product design, so designing products um, that are repairable, that are more durable, that are modular, and can be kept in the system for longer. And the third one is the narrowing of the resource flows. This is the broadest and the most comprehensive view of the circular economy, where um, there are basically three pillars of it. The first is the increased resource productivity. The second has to do with the sharing economy, and the third one has to do with the new ways of consumption. So if these definitions or these views are about circular economy, what does the circular economy contribute to, 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 to us? Well, circular economy, first of all, helps to lower the virgin material extraction rates and also helps to um, tackle or mitigate or facilitate, actually, the environmental synergy. So we have the, the environmental benefit. We also do have the economic benefit, which is um, the supply security, so the whole geopolitical um, situation for countries that are um, just like Czech Republic that don't have loads of resources domestically and the improved trade balance and the third one is the social perspective so um, creating new economic opportunities for bottom-up and new uh, possibilities for green jobs along these lines um, and along actually also the interest of the member countries of the OECD, um, we, these are basically the key trends that we speak about when we talk about circular economy and these are the key lines of research that we have in place. So we are looking at the economic benefits um, modeling of the circular economy. We are looking at the trade and the economy. Um, we have analysis on policy guidance for resource efficiency and extended producer responsibility. We are look, working a lot, me personally, on the new business models, on the digitalization and the labeling. And we are also kicking out a new stream of research which is looking at plastics. So I would like to take now um, some minutes to talk about, um, to, to dive deeper in the new business models and the digitalization and actually how the new business models are operationalizing or helping to operationalize the whole transition towards circular economy. So circular business models are modifying material flows. They are helping to keep the material flows within the economy rather than making it flow throughout. Um, and um, they are actually having environmental, lesser environmental footprint than the traditional business models. Um, as you will see on this slide, I try to dig out some what I have considered um, circular examples here in the Czech Republic along the five business models that we have um, um, identified in, within our work at the OECD. So the first one would be circular, su circular supply. So that's the use of renewable and bio-based inputs, as well as use of recycled inputs. So for example, if you use recycled material for br building bridges or building houses. The second one is the classical recycling, but also industrial symbiosis. So you have um, some exchange platforms where um, output or the waste of 
one of the companies is used um, as an input at the highest value for another company. And then you have the classical repairs, reuse, remanufacturing, so trying to keep everything in the system as long as possible. Um, the sharing, um, this is basically the use, the optimization of the use of the idle resources. These are examples you all know, like Uber and Airbnb. And then the product service systems. So instead of offering the products, you would be offering the systems. And all these have in common that they are, as I have said before, are narrowing the resource use, the resource flows, and are closing the loops by keeping everything at its highest level and by that also easing the pressure on the virgin material extraction. So despite, and I'm, I'm realizing this is a bit noisy as a slide, but despite the recognized environmental benefit, the problem is that many of these circular models are not really picking up. They are currently in economic niches, and basically with the exception of what you all might know as Spotify, so putting up the digital content, um, all of them are typically having a penetration below 15%. So the question is what can be done? One of the answers is the policy. We obviously need policy and the policy makers to clear the barriers, the regulatory barriers. We need to make sure um, that they do not favor the incumbents. We need to make sure there are no subsidies to the extractive industries. We also um, need to make sure that there is no more mispricing of the externalities in the products and services. Um, promotion of the supply of circular products, promotion of the demand of circular products, and the coherence, not only social policy objectives as it's stated there, but in more general of climate policy and the resource management policies. And besides the policy, what's actually happening as a trend is the digitalization. So the digitalization is helping to um, scale up some of the circular business models. And it is happening through making the physical assets more intelligent, basically by um, allowing them to um, sense and collect, gather and process the data and work it out or put it together into information and create new knowledge. New knowledge about the materials, about their proven provenience, about their uses, about the products, about the manufacturing of the products, um, the repair needs of the products, the recyclability of the products. So these are some of the technologies that we've been looking at the OECD and how they have been um, actually influencing the circular business models. Um, this is one of my favorite slides because it shows what digital technologies are actually doing in the private sector and it, they help to solve the market failures. So there are different kind of market failures and we've been going through the literature and have identified the imperfect information and the transaction costs you all might be aware of as the most important um, market failures in the private sector. So if you are looking for matching the supply and the demand, how does uh, digitalization help for that? Well, you have um, some of the resource platforms that are uh, machine learning, AI driven, and blockchain um, is also helping there, that are helping to match supply and demand. The same thing you have for Uber, you have for Airbnb, but you also have smart contracts, um, for example, when renewable energy is fed into the grid, so the producer and the actual consumer are connected to, thanks to these technologies through smart contracts. For the imperfect information, this is basically what I've been already talking about. So information about what is the quality of, of the component, um, where is it coming from, how can it be reused, was it repaired, if it was modified, how can it be recycled, how can it be recovered. So examples of these are blockchain-based digital passports, for example, or blockchain and artificial intelligence that are being used for better predictive maintenance so that you know you don't have to break down the whole, um, I don't know, um, a ship, but you localize where the problem is and you are going to replace that certain part which is about to be broken at that certain time. So um, digital technologies can also leverage or be leveraged by the policymakers. I don't know whether we have any policymakers here, but just in short, um, they are helping the policymakers in, in doing the preliminary analysis before doing the policies. If you are thinking about the 
crowd source data or the geo um, data that can be used for better urban planning or um, for the policy design. Um, if you are thinking, for example, of for the municipal waste, municipal policymakers, how they know based on the smart bins which bins in the city are go going to get filled at which rate with what kind of waste, and then they can better devise the routes for the pickup of this waste. Um, and the third one would be the implementation. So this would be basically um, examples of monitoring the hazardous waste exports um, or illegal dumping. So these are the positive sides. However, digital circular economy can also have some downsides, um, starting with the fact that digital has a lot to do with uh, the data security, with the data ownership, with the whole, the whole thing around IPRs. There are also some unintended consequences. For example, the environmental rebound effect. How many of you have taken Uber or any other shared um, um, mobility service instead of taking um, public transportation. Um, or if you're thinking of um, certain cities where, which are being overrun by tourists and the flats are being rented for Airbnb, the local people have to go out to the cities and that causes urban sprawl. They have to take the car in order for them to get back to the cities. Then we have the social aspect, which we have heard a lot about. This has to do with um, mainly the digital aspect of the circular economy. That's going to be the new skills. That's going to be um, basically some, some jobs in some industries um, being displaced to others, typically. For the economic unintended consequences, um, there is a risk that um, the bigger companies are better able to use these digital technologies as AI, machine learning, and blockchain. And that's why it might cause market concentration at the expense, at the expense of the small and medium-sized enterprises. And finally, the regulatory this is the unexpected regulation when the regulators come and say, um, we don't want Uber in this country, or we want everybody who's renting something on Airbnb to, to declare. So these are things that are hampering the sharing models, typically. So in conclusion to this part, basically the transition to a digital circular economy needs to be carefully managed. And it needs to balance the two sides. So it is the digitally enabled circular activities that need to be facilitated. And it needs to be able to mitigate the risks. I'm not going to go into the details. In, in, instead, I would just like to spend 30 seconds on the last slide and basically reiterate that the circular economy is based on what I have presented, and I hope you all agree, is going to be very important for easing the environmental pressure, for easing the possible geopolitical pressure from the supply risk, um, for making sure there are enough resources within the country, that there is not too high material consumption or that this is uh, decreasing, that we can create new innovative technologies and that we can create new jobs and new skills. And these things that I have just mentioned now are part of the vision of the new National Circular Economy Strategic Framework um, that the Ministry of Environment of Czech Republic is developing, and the OECD has been asked to help um, provide some input into this framework. So um, it is a project that's being funded by the Structural Reform Support System of the European Union. And um, our input is going to be twofold. We are going to develop a report which is going to inform directly the strategy. And the second one is the stakeholder engagement. And part of the stakeholder engagement is listening to the people, to the people of the country who have been facing the daily issues and who know how circular economy is functioning already now in Czech Republic and what needs to change, what needs to happen, what are the opportunities and what are the barriers. So I'll be around and if anybody would like to share some views, you are all very welcome as part of the circular economy stakeholders. Conscious of time, thank you so much for bearing with me. And I'm I, I can't be more floor. pleased Eva with you because you've really, you know, taken all my words to your heart and kept it really to the limit. So thank you very much. Please come and join me. We have the chair ready for you.